All right. Good morning, everybody. Happy Saturday, all of us. Thank you so much today for joining our code pudding. My name is Tiffany Hall. I'm an alumni of Triple Ten Software Engineering Program. I'm a full stack engineer at Scholastic Inc., the world's largest publisher of children's books. And I am also the owner of my own company, Rylex Custom Works. Tonight, or today, this morning, I get to be uh, an extra thing. It's, I get to be the host of our very first code pudding for our data science program. So I'm very excited about that. I'm really happy to see that there's so many people joining us today. That is super wonderful. Um, let's talk a little bit about what our code jams and code puddings are. In case you're not familiar, the Triple Ten that has a lot of friendly competitions between our, our students. And so one of the things that we do is a code pudding where it's really short where we get students together from all over the U.S. And during their normal coursework, on top of that, we also give them a prompt that they have to meet. The teams get divided, and then they have to work collaboratively together to meet the prompt and meet our judging criteria. All of the teams you're about to see and all of the projects you're about to see only had four days to work on these projects. So again, super short just jamming it out, getting it in as quick as they can. Today, our two, um, our, today our teams are gonna show off their projects to all of you out there watching, and our judges will review them next week, and then the judges will evaluate them on the data and the presentation, so two parts. We will post our results on Instagram and in Discord, and um, that will be on April 8th, so look for those results then. All of our students that are watching uh, can vote for their favorite project during the following week. We're gonna post those polls in our student discord. Also, if you're watching at home, you can go ahead and vote in the chat or in the comments below on which one you like the best. And our audience award will go to one of our teams that was kind of a fan favorite, if you think about it. So very excited about these things, we're going to go ahead and introduce our teams. We're going to see what they've accomplished and uh, let's wish them all good luck. All right, we have four teams this morning. Um, first team, let's see, is Team Horizon Nexus Alliance. And that team consists of Angel Martinez Matute, uh, Priyanka Ma uh, Makur, let me try that again, Priyanka Makari and then Lee Redfern. And I believe Lee, you are presenting, is that correct? We all will be presenting. Oh, I will fantastic. Be presenting the dashboard um, as we present. Okay, that sounds wonderful. Well, so, by all means. Point. <laughs> all right, Horizon Nexus Alliance, take it away. Screen, almost there. Here we go. Hello, everyone. I'm Priyanka. I'm here with Angel and Lee. Together, we form the Horizon Nexus Alliance. We are really excited to share our work with all of you. So our data comes from Spotify. And as you all know, it's a big deal in the music world. We picked it to see what songs are popular, uh, what songs are people liking and how trends change since lots of people use Spotify to listen to music. Before my friend takes you through our visualization, I will quickly explain what our data includes. This will help you to understand our findings better. So we have here track name, artist name, BPM, danceability, balance, acousticness, instrumentalness, liveliness, and speechiness. In the coming moment, we will discover what was the pop most popular track, who was the most popular artist, what are attributes, who had the most tracks, and who had the best year. Before that, I'm going to tell you there are 953 total number of songs, 645 total artists, total streams for each songs is 489 billion total artists for 
top 40 are 33 and total streams for top 40 songs is 93 billion. Now my friend Lee will take from here. Good morning and thanks again for joining Horizon Nexus Alliance. My name is Lee and I'll be taking you through our dashboards and a few of our findings. Using industry standard top 40 charts, tracks, we see that Blinding Lights by the Weekend has the most streams at over 3.7 billion. Following closely a Shape of You by Ed Sheeran with over 3.5. So we wanted to see if there were characteristics or attributes that led to Blinding Lights' as lead. So an attribute is defined as a quality or feature regarded as a characteristic or inherent part of someone or something. So an acousticness talks about the amount of acoustic sound in the song, energy, perceived energy levels of the song. So the overall volume, the sound density, instrumentals, instrumentalness, the amount of instrumental content in the song, uh, liveness, presence of live performance elements like uh, audience participation, clapping, cheering, speechiness. Is this more of a spoken word, uh, podcast, audiobook type stream? Valence, the uh, positivity of the song's musical content, so are the, are the vibes good? Uh, danceability, the percentage indicating how suitable the song is for dance. So really just how likely are you to be bobbing and weaving and shaking your head while you're listening to the song? You know, that's what danceability is. So going back here, I also noticed that The Weeknd has multiple songs in the our top 40. He's got number one with Binding Lights with over 3.7 billion, but he's also got number 40 with just over 1.6. So seeing that he's got multiple in the top 40, I wanted to see if there were more artists that had uh, multiple chart toppers. We see here that Ed Sheeran, he's got four bangers. Shape of You, Perfect, Thinking Out Loud, and Photograph. The Weeknd comes in at number three. And if you want to be super, super technical, The Weeknd has a, a couple more as a co-author, uh, one here with Starboy, okay? But if I know anything about pop culture of 2023 is where in the world is Taylor Swift in all of this? Like we said, The Weeknd is, not only has the highest streamed song, he also has the most streams, period. Taylor Swift is coming in hot also, just at over 14 billion. So why doesn't she have the top 40? Well, good for because, her. Because she's I got used Apple Music? Tracks. Yeah, she's got 34 tracks in the entire data set. The Weekend Trails with 22, Bad Bunny 19, and you can see a significant drop in the amount of uh, songs that each artist has in our top data set. But I gotta, I, I, I need to know and understand more about Tay Tay. So like I said, The Weekend, most streams, but he's getting carried by blinding lights. You can see a huge change in his number one and number two. And I look over at Queen Taylor's songs. She's got 34 songs on the chart, like we said. And so I'm led to believe that Swifties, Taylor Swift's fan base, are more likely to be in their feels and they're listening to her entire catalog while the Weekends fans are listening to blinding lights on repeat. So with that, I want to ask, where do we go from here? And my friend Angel will take us out. Hi, guys. I'm Angel. And before letting you guys go, I'd like to give you our key insights to conclude our presentation. We can see that Taylor Swift had the most amount of songs with 34, indicating her availability to her audience and giving them a wide selection. We see Ed Sheeran had the most songs in the top 40 with four songs, indicating most back-to-back -back hits. And we see the weekend song, Blinding Lights, with 3.7 billion plays. This shows the repeatability of his music. So with that being said, we can ask where we can go from here. We can see with additional demographic data, if provided, we could dive into who or what makes a Taylor Swift fan a Swifty. And maybe that data can show different demographics like women, men, age, and how that might affect Taylor Swift fans. Additionally, we could dive into data by time. We could see how a song's streams might be affected in different months of the year, how they might increase or decrease. 
all in all, we can see that these three artists are the three top performers, no matter which way you put it. With that being said, I'd like to thank you guys for listening. On behalf of Priyanka, Lee, and I, thank you. Oh my goodness, that was wonderful. I love it so much. Okay, so that is Horizon Nexus Alliance. Um, let me ask you guys some questions real quick before I let you go and we move on to the next one. First of all, um, I love, love, love seeing all of this data um, coming from a world of education. It's really amazing to see how you took this data and like turned it into this whole story around who is doing it better, but not just who and why. And so I guess a question to anybody on the team really is, did you guys meet together and decide what questions you were going to answer? Or is that part of like the, the part of the schooling that you're getting with triple 10, right? Is like there's standard questions that you always need to answer. So I'll go first. Uh okay. I'm a 17-year uh, veteran of music education, and uh, I would be the first to say that I had no interest in Spotify uh, music stuff just because I wanted to be able to look at a data set without any kind of uh, bias that I previously had as my role as a music educator. So I was more sure. interested in the, in the uh, Amazon, and, and I even forgot about the other um, the, the other data sets provided. But I know uh, Priyanka and Angel stated interest, and I said, well, um, this could be good. And maybe I can, you know, lend some of my uh, background knowledge into um, what some of this uh, attribute, what some of these attributes mean. Um, yeah, we, we did come up with the with a few questions, you know, like we, we kind of wanted to see if there were trends at all, um, you know, with the schooling that we had, you know, it's some of the easiest things to look for is who like what what was the highest numbers? Where are the highest numbers and what are they attached to? So with this, it was easy to see that um, streams was kind of our like common denominator of all our tracks. You know, every track has an, the amount of streams. So we just kind of wanted to see who who um, who had the highest and uh, who was more common. You know, and we all know we can't talk about 2023 without Taylor Swift. So we kind of wanted to see, um, you know, how she fared in all of this. And initially we went a long time without seeing her name at all. You know, because we wanted to, you know, really see what were the, what was, what was a banger? You know, what was the the hottest song of 2023? And she's not, and like we said, like she's not on there at all. But her fans or people that are listening to her music, they're probably they're more likely listening to her entire album at once instead of just like one song on repeat. But so those are, her. yeah, those are a couple of questions that we that we asked, and we also uh, wanted to see if there were attributes that um led to blinding lights being number one and to be quite honest not really we wanted to see if tempo had any kind of um oh, determination of you know what song was uh the highest and really it isn't you know blinding lights has a tempo of 171 and shape of view has a tempo of uh, 98 so you're going from a sprint to you know just kind of leaning back and forth in your chair and number one and number two. So tempo doesn't really have, um, you know, any kind of dependence on, you know, a, a song's popularity. So we kind of like had assumptions, but we quickly learned that, you know, some of those things, like it just doesn't really matter. Mu music is going to be popular because people like what they listen to. Interesting. Priyanka, Angel, what do you guys think? I think Lee really summed it up with that last point that like people. It's that teacher are, in him, isn't it? It just takes over. He can't <laughs> help it. It's, people are going to like the music. And at first we were trying to find how he mentioned different attributes and factors that might have to do with the music's popularity, whether what time it was released in or mm. the different attributes. The danceability. Like that was a cool yeah. metric you guys put together. Yeah. And more towards the end, we came to find we focus more on explaining the data rather than trying to find one specific thing that made a certain song a banger. Cause we did also realize that there, there are certain data points that are missing that in future analysis we could use 
to improve it like genre or if the data is tracked over a certain period of time and not just by release dates of the okay. tracks themselves so if the data was tracked by m month to month for example in 2023 we could use that to our advantage but in the end we just ended up finding the most popular tracks artists and the artists with most repeatability all right priyanka uh yeah like we were playing with the data set like we wanted to see where it's going and then one by one like it's one leads to another first we were searching for the highest number of songs the highest clicks the highest tracks but when we are doing that we we were getting many insights from those visualization and oh, okay. those so kind of questions were coming up as you were yeah. discovering the data Yes. Got it. So that's very, leads us very cool. I love that you guys were able to um, quantify things that I um, never thought could be quantified, right? So like the danceability we mentioned first, um, but then you guys displayed this whole list of different things was were those metrics things that you guys had to look up or were those metrics things you just made up? They were, they were provided. And I think uh, the more interesting part of that was uh, what it um, was, what each attribute defined. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of these characteristics of uh, really of music in general is so subjective. You know, if, just because blinding lights has a high danceability, it doesn't mean that you are going to dance to it. You know, I personally, um, you know, don't really listen to the weekend, but the sound density, the studio, like the, the perfection level, the auto tune level of it, you know, the, the high refinement of that, you know, mm -hmm. gives, gives me a reason to keep listening to it instead of, you know, hitting, um, hitting next on, on my Spotify shuffle. And, you know, if a podcast were to come up while I'm listening to music, I'm probably going to hit next too. So it's, it's more of, um, it's, it's more of like what this stuff means within itself. You know, it's not necessarily, um, blinding lights had the most danceability because it didn't across, um, the data set, but in itself, danceability was probably its leading characteristic, um, over, the other characteristics that um, were also given within that song. So not necessarily compared across other tracks, but within itself. How is its danceability compared to its energy or its liveness? Very cool. Well, thank you all for being here today and sharing this project. It's really, really cool. I can't wait to look into it um, more and kind of play with the data that you guys have presented. Um, once again, this is Horizon Nexus Alliance. It's Angel Martinez Mut Matut. Is that right, Angel? All right. And then Priyanka, you can validate this one. Okay. Priyanka Makher Makherji. Yeah. It All is. All right. I'm getting there, you <laughs> guys. All right. And then Lee Redfern. Thank you guys so very much. Um, I really appreciate it. And um, we're going to move on to our next team. Our next team is Puddin in the work. Because oh, it's a good pudding. It's okay. A little early for jokes. I get it. So we're going to go ahead and move on. I have this presentation. They weren't able to be here this morning um, to present. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and I am going to share my screen. And there's going to be audio. Ooh, let's hope I can share the audio. If you can't, just let me know, and I would be more than happy to improvise as we go. I just have my baby here, so you will hear a couple of quirks and laughs along the way. <laughs> oh, well, that's okay. Um, my baby is in the other room because he chews on bones. <laughs> oh, <Yeah. laughs> poor legs. Okay, right? <laughs> let me go ahead and share the screen, and let's see how this goes. Share sound. Made. 
Okay. All right. It says I am sharing screen. Fantastic. Okay. This is putting in the work, Spotify data analysis. Presenting this data was made possible by the contributions of three team members, Jasmine C., Jillian K., and Nitha H.R. Teaming up together allowed us to bring strong data analysis skills paired with high artistic value. The years 2020 onward were a time when humanity was seeking connection. When the world was still and we had the ability to connect with ourselves, music became a go-to for the connectedness humanity was seeking. Streaming platforms became more useful, which allowed the collection of data that we will be interpreting today. Observing the Spotify charts from the year 2020 to 2023, Team putting in the work found that the key and mode of music produced, streamed, and played correlated to the human connectedness we were all seeking. The data presented in this slide is going to be the base of our analysis. We will use this data extraction to build on the data throughout our presentation. For this visual, we are looking at the range of modes and keys color coded to show the positivity ranking of music streamed in the years 2020 to 2023. We can theorize that listeners were seeking a positive connection with music as the conduit. To back this claim, we wanted to show that the number of streams and music released increased within the years 2020 to 2023. The data trends will show the emotional landscape that artists were expressing and streamers were seeking to bridge the gap in emotional and physical connection within the musical realm. To further investigate our presented theory of music and the profound effect music has on human connection, we utilize the previous filters and yearly range. We divert to using an energy rating to show a correlation of streams to desired energy of music. Data shows that music streamed in C sharp major had a 69% energy rating. We can theorize that streamers needed to connect and create a sense of higher energy and positivity at a time when physical and emotional connections were lacking. While keeping the same filters and yearly range, we calculate the average danceability score. Streams are calculated in each mode and key to further express the general desire for positivity in the music stream. During this time, with the need for connection, as data shows, listeners were streaming tracks with a 70% average danceability. The need for emotional connection stayed a prevalent factor in the choice of music streams. The focus of this data is the release year. Years are broken down by mode of major and minor within the years of 2020 to 2023 to further understand the correlation of the cultural landscape of that year and the music release. Keys in minor mode dominated in 2020, which defines a clear connection between the cultural and emotional landscape experienced across the globe between artists and listeners. Tracks using only five keys in major mode within this year were released, whereas tracks using 10 keys in minor mode were released. In following years, the full spectrum of major and minor mode tracks were released as the cultural and emotional landscape improved. Data represents music in the key of C sharp in the mode of major to evoke feelings of grief and despair masked by the air of happiness. 
How Chords and Keys Impact Emotions in Music, published by themusicstudio.com. D major invokes feelings of seriousness, concern, and contemplation. The progression of music in this specific time period speaks of the way the worldwide events impacted the music stream produced and played. This bar chart represents music streamed on all four major streaming platforms globally. The calculations are representing all accumulated streams within the respective time period. Evidence concludes across popular streaming platforms that within the years 2020 to 2023, listeners were streaming music most in the key and mode of C sharp major with the exception of the Deezer charts, showing a deviation with G major in the lead. In essence, the data presented by Team Putin in the work serves as a testament to the endearing power of music as a universal language of connection. As we navigate an ever-changing world, may these insights continue to inspire dialogue and understanding fostering bonds that transcend boundaries and unite us all in the shared experience of humanity. Thank you. Marvelous. Okay. That was really cool. So um, let me just minimize that make sure we have all of our things fantastic okay so that was team putting in the work love the name and that was jillian kingsley jasmine campos and then nitha ramathuri uh ramamurthy oh so close <laughs> sorry nitha okay rama ramamurthy rama say it again nitha uh ramamurthy Rama Murthy. Correct. Yeah. All right. I will get that. <laughs> All right. Okay. So let's talk questions. Nitha, since I have um uh have you here mm -hmm. and the others as well. Nitha, what was one of your favorite parts about connecting with other teammates um for this project? Because I know all teammates are in different places in the program. And so what was one of your favorite parts about that? Uh, yeah, uh, so we uh, initially uh, uh, just uh, looked at the uh, data sets and uh, uh, we uh, we uh, kind of finalized on uh, what timing works for uh, each of us because uh, uh, three of us are in three different time zones. Uh, I'm in Pacific uh, and Jasmine is in uh, uh, Central and uh, Jillian... Uh, is an Eastern time zone, oh, uh, and wow. actually, and this it was uh, uh, really uh, you know challenging because uh, Jillian is towards the end of her pregnancy, just one week to go. Yeah, and we could have uh, you know uh, have uh, have her uh, go into labor any time. Uh, oh, yes, so this live but, stream could have been from was, the hospital. Yeah, but <laughs> but she was amazing. Oh my god! Yeah. Um, she she put in all the work definitely <laughs> like uh, the and uh, all, all three of us are like uh, and Jasmine and me are already moms and she is the soon mom to be yeah so uh, we really wanted to have this uh, putting in the work it it just uh sounded like a perfect one for us and uh yeah uh, we uh, decided on a time that works best for us and okay. uh, uh I would say uh, another thing was to uh, work on, uh, uh, we initially started off uh, with uh, what our strengths and weaknesses are, and we tried to focus on that and go, uh, you know, tackle this uh, problem with that. That's a great idea. Um, Jillian, what, I mean, apparently uh, mom of the year doing this like right up into the minute. Uh, have you had your baby? Are you still pregnant? Still pregnant. Uh, okay. Still waving. So any minute now. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> but, you know, I know one of the questions that a lot of people ask is like doing this project and 
on top of your regular work, but then on top of all of the other kind of life constraints, um, in, it sounds like you guys had a really great team structure. Was there any particular way? Um, so Nisa mentioned that you guys focused on your strengths. How did you guys split the work so that it, you know, it really did play to the strengths, but also help you guys grow? Um, really the way that we kind of broke it up was, um, we all dove into the data on our own, uh, initially, um, to just see what insights we could pull. And that was really helpful. Um, we each made some visualizations and, um, got to explore the data and that gave us a lot of ideas. So um, the work ended up breaking up more like um, I did a bunch of the visual visualizations. Um, Nitha contributed um, some visualizations. And then um, we all worked on collaborating on the story, but Jasmine was definitely um, like the, the lead on forming the story portion and um Nitha was filling in the gaps of wherever we had um any kind of lack or um something missing she would zero in on that and say oh we need more information here we need another visualization something like that um mm -hmm. so it ended up breaking up kind of like that um as we uh as we worked together um based on our strengths so super cool it worked out well yeah it sounds like it and jasmine what was your one of your favorite parts to create um creating artistically was looking at something so black and white and turning it into color you know there's human connectedness in everything that we do so why not why not add a little bit of color where it could use it? <laughs> um, and then yeah. collaborating with Jillian and um, Nitha was exceptionally challenging because of our time zones. We're all three extremely busy women, but all dedicated. So getting to be creative and work on each other's strengths and um, collaborate from there, I believe was very rewarding and probably my favorite part of creating was getting to put all three minds together and build each other up to tell a story that made sense to all three of us. Yeah, it's a really interesting perspective on um, a, the, a similar data set, right? Because everyone had access to the same data sets. Uh, my cousin Sharla is um, a just renowned pianist and teacher of music. And I can't wait to show her y'all's presentation because I think she will really just uh, nerd out in the best way possible about the the keys and the majors and how those are showing up, um, like you said, over time. So I'm really Thank excited. Thank you. That's an honor. That is, that yeah, is what we're no, here I'm, to I'm do really is. excited about it. Amazing. All right. Yeah, I'm gonna, Thank you. Oh, so that is putting in the work. Um, with Jillian Kingsley, Jasmine Campos, and Nitha Ramu Ramamuthri. Ramamuthi. Ramamuthi. Yeah, I'm almost. So sorry, Nitha. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. So sorry. Um, and uh, Jillian, in case you need to hop off, we understand. And congratulations early on the birth of your baby. Thank yes, you so much. Congratulations. All right, we are going to talk to Data Hunters next. Data Hunters, we have um, Simran July, Jesus Correa, and then Ksenia Gormash. Hi. Hi, let me share my screen. That would be great. I'm excited to see what you guys have for us. All right. <clears throat> so hi, everyone. Hope everyone's having a good morning. 
Um, so in this data, data set, we're looking at Amazon Books. And in our group, we have Senya, Jesus, and myself, Simran. Um, so uh, it's called Authors and Audiences, a data-driven look at book trends. Next. Uh, so for our analysis, the purpose was to uncover trends and we're analyzing genre diversity, pricing strategies, and also author impact. And this is providing insights for publishers, authors, and readers. So our goal for this analysis, we had divided it up into three groups. So we have genre exploration. Uh, we're looking at popular and niche genres and subgenres. We have price insights, uh, we're examining how book prices vary across genres and seeing the relationship between price and reader satisfaction. And lastly, we have author impact. So looking at the influence of authorship and how that can impact book performance. And we did a bit, a bit of data cleaning before using our data. So for this um, data set, we were given three files on genres, subgenres, and book details. Um, but for our analysis, we're just going to be focusing on the books table because we felt like it pretty much had all the information we'll be needing. So for a data conversion, we transformed the data from string format to numeric. And then we also did currency conversion. So our uh, original price column was in Indian rupees. And we removed the rupee symbol and we converted the price to USD. Next. Uh, so firstly, we looked at genre exploration. So this first dashboard is pretty simple. It has mostly three charts. So first we have a bar chart with genre distribution, seeing what is the most popular genre. We have top subgenres. So this is a stacked bar chart with subgenres within genres. And then lastly, we were looking at average ratings by genre. And then next slide. Can you see it? Uh, it's on the genre, it's on the dashboard. Okay, good. So uh, some of the conclusions we saw from the genre insights. So romance genre was the highest uh, with 916 titles and children's books genre was a close second. And then at the bottom, we saw a handful of book genres that had about 50 titles. And then once we look at subgenres, we saw that most of these books were evenly distributed with about 50 titles. And children's books, again, had the most subgenres at 29. Uh, we saw that the same, we saw that the same handful of book genres that were at the bottom uh, were also at the bottom for the subgenres because they didn't have multiple of that. And for ratings, most of the genres were rated above a 4.2, so pretty fairly rated. Uh, multiple genres were at the top with 4.5, and the lowest was 3.1 for law. And so we could see that the genres and subgenres have a positive correlation, as the top genres have the most subgenres and vice versa. So children's books and romance were taking the lead uh, for most books and most subgenres. And then we also saw that average ratings do not have a correlation with the genres. Uh, so those were in our conclusions for the genre insights. Next. Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm going to cover trends and insights about price and strategies that can help uh, book readers and professionals in the industry to make informed decisions about pricing. Uh, first of all, we're going to start with main genre in the top left. Uh, we can see that we have an average price of genre of $6.33. Uh, in the graph, we tend to be a slightly 
uh, uptrend on genres related to educational types. Educational books tend to be more expensive when we compare it to the average price. Then we can see in the type of books that hardcover and audible audiobooks are the ones on the top that are more expensive compared to the Kindle editions that are electronically. Uh, can, these can tell us like uh, how technology optimizes the price of books. And with the best selling books, like seven out of 10 on the, of the top 15 are Harry Potter books. And in the top 10, the Harry Potter books are above the price average. They tend to be like more than $10. So that shows us how people like when, when we build popular brands, uh, it doesn't affect the price. People are, are willing to pay a higher price for something popular. Fiction and nonfiction. We can see a really high difference between fiction and nonfiction. Nonfiction books tend to be more expensive and fiction books tend to be more affordable for the people. Um, also, the, we see a 69% in, in difference of pricing between fiction and nonfiction. And in the top, top, top 20 subgenre prices, we can see the bigger the bigger size of the of the circles. Tend, we, we can see an abundance of fiction books in these top 20 some general prices with also at affordable price. So fiction books tend to be more cheaper. And in the main genre, this supports this thesis that the fiction books are more cheaper. So people like a balance between uh, books that have a narrative that are interesting. People tend to go for a book when isn't is for entertainment entertainment not not that much for informational inform uh, for information like educational for college and other things so we can go to the next slide uh the price insights conclusions we have an average price of six dollars 33 cents we already covered that educational fields tend to be more expensive fiction books are more affordable and our price below the average. Hardcover books have an average price of $10.81, audible books at $10.44, so there's not a big difference. Electronic books are cheaper. So that shows us that, as I said before, how technology can, can optimize the price of books. And we can see in the future a trend of people going to digital books. Harry Potter is one of the top best selling books, having a Way above average price above ten dollars. Fiction books tend to be like below six dollars, and fiction books six nine percent cheaper. We got an abundance of affordable books in the fiction side, but not in the nonfiction. So readers prefer to prefer engaging narratives at budget friendly prices, making fiction a popular choice. So we can see a price analysis between between the relationship of book and reader satisfaction. So we can go to the next one. So let's dive into the influence of, author, of authors on book performance. On this dashboard, we can see four graphs. First one shows the most prolific authors and we can see what Wonder House books uh, published three times more than the following Marple Press. On the second graph, we can see highly rated uh, books with their authors and genres. Uh, third graph uh, let us explore authors not that just frequently published, but also made them a uh, high rating. We can see the outlier here. This is Joan Rowling. She, <laughs> she published almost five times more books than the following author, and she has um, rating only 4.7 uh, and uh, most authors with excellent rating of five sell less which shows us that uh, strong author brands is more important than uh, rating and ratings high ratings don't always lead to high sales uh, 
four graphs let us let us identify if uh, certain authors specialize on specific genres and some subgenres. Uh, so let's move to conclusions. I already said about Van Der Haus books and John Rowling. And uh, sorry. Also, we can see that major sales concentrated in children's books, romance, literature, fiction, crime, and thrillers. And specific authors actually do specialize on a certain uh, genres and they dominate in them. So in summary, <clears throat> um, we can see what high ratings don't really play big role in the book performance, strong outer branding, branding does and specializing on a certain brains, brands, uh, on a certain genres. <laughs> Sorry, John Rowling and Wanderhaus books are prime examples. So let's move to <clears throat> recommendations. So my recommendations would be explore less common genres and subgenres to attract new readers, uh, set prices based on genres format and demand to boost profit, uh, focus on building strong outer brands and genre specialization to boost market presence, and develop targeted marketing strategies to promote and to increase the visibility of highly rated authors and genres. Uh, by implementing these strategies, uh, publishers and uh, book selling platforms like Amazon Books can increase market share uh, and enhance, enhance readers' engagement and uh, boost profit. So <laughs> uh, thank you for your attention and you are now welcome to ask questions. Fantastic. Really great work. I mean, really impressive with the information about the books, but also like how they, the intersection between the price and the genre and, and the kind of conclusions you guys were able to pull out there. Um, I have some, I know some people who are interested in books and book sales. And so I am, um, it'd be really cool for me to share this with them and show them just, again, another way of thinking about the same types of stuff that is, is our lives every day and in, in our work life. I'm going to ask um, some questions. Let's start with uh, Simran. You talked about cleaning the data. Now, so for people who are watching this at home, are you getting out a mop and bucket? Is it like a Mr. Clean Magic Eraser? Like what kind of cleaning are we doing with this data? Uh, so sometimes the data is not 100% ready for you to analyze. And if you just go ahead with that, it, it will not give you the results you want because it won't be in the right format. So okay. first, um, when you get the data, you have to take a look at it and see if it's in the right format. So like we said, um, some of the some of the things were in string format when we wanted okay. numeric. So string is like, it's kind of lit, written like a word instead of numbers. Mm -hmm. So you have to go ahead and change that. Um, and then another data cleaning thing we did was um, convert the rupees into USD. And so for that, we just added another column in Excel and did that. Taking off the conversion data. there. Yeah, the conversion there and then just re-uploading the data. Fantastic. Cool. Thank you. That is very helpful. Um, let's see. Jesus, what was surprising to you about the data as you guys were kind of pulling it through and coming up with these conclusions? the the price about the data you said yeah well uh i me i'm a big time reader i like to read a lot i'm more in the side of non-fiction so okay. when i was 
going through the data, it started to make sense because I buy, I buy books every month. And when I start seeing like fiction books are ten, tend to be more cheaper, it makes sense because most of the times when people want to write a book, it's a way to know disconnect from the outside world without the technology. And it makes sense that it was below the average price. Also, yeah. it makes sense the type of books when we talk about hardcovers and paperback are more expensive because obviously it has some operational costs that you have to cover with the materials of the book. And totally. people, like people sometimes like to feel tangible things. So that comes with a price. But now with the currently improving of the technology, we can optimize the price of books, making them uh, digital. So you can just download it in a matter of a second and you have a book in your home. So that's more cheaper. So when I was looking through the data, it wouldn't be crazy for me to think that we're tra doing a transition towards more digital books because information is more cheap to access with that. Mm. Because if you buy a hardcover book, you have to wait like two or three days to arrive at your home. You're going to pay a price. But if you want some budget-friendly books, you can have the same but in a digital way. So it's really an um, opportunity like uh, to to try to diversify your your reader base. Exactly. If you think through yeah. that. Very cool. I would say that if a publisher wants to, you know, have an idea of a book and wants to go to a mm -hmm. big market, fiction is a good option. And mm -hmm. I was meant to have also the digital version with the out uh, with the Kindle version. Very cool. Uh, to try to, you know, satisfy the old school readers. They like to fill the pages and read, and the new boomers are like to more technological and digital and easier things to have to have. Awesome, thank you. And Castina, what there were a lot of visualizations in this. You guys really, as a team, just packed in the visualizations. Do you have a special visualization that is like your favorite to create? <laughs> My favorite to create. <laughs> yeah. Like, I really enjoy the bubble ones. The bubble ones are my favorite when I'm looking at them. Um, but that tends to, like, track with my personality. So are there any ones that, like, you really, like, do you like the one that has all of the little graph, um, the cubes, right? Where the bigger the cube, the more impact it is, or the bubbles, or the bar graph, or then you guys had one of those visualizations where it was like a bubble graph and a bar graph. It blew my mind with that one. For me, I like bar charts. Where you okay, can bar charts. All right, Cindy, what about you? I can say, but I like list bar charts <laughs> oh you least like easy... the bar charts okay i like so Ren, what are you how are where are your feelings on bar charts <laughs> mine i'm i'm for bar charts <laughs> i, I feel right. like they're pretty they're pretty simple to create and um I feel like you're, it's easier to tell the difference like this is obviously okay. higher than this by this much um yeah like the other visuals like the um which ones did you mention like the circles oh yes the circle with the bubbles where the bigger the bubble the, the 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 more impact it had yeah the bubbles they look nice but I feel like it's harder to tell the difference like you have to like get close to it and see like sure is it that big of a difference or not but well, bar charts they, see they, that, kind of, uh... they could be ugly but <laughs> they do the job I do see uh, there is a trend amongst uh, some of the other data students on here because I see a vote bar chart from Lee uh, and I see a lot of head nods around bar charts. So perhaps from a data perspective, um, bar charts might be just the winning candidate. <laughs> that was really cool. Okay, we have one more presentation and that is another another really fun name, Chart Cootery. <laughs> So with that, I'm going to present that one. We've got a recorded video. So give me one moment here. All right. And we will get charcuterie up and going. Oh. 
All right. All right, here we go. Good morning. I'm Tony, and my team is Eric and Michelle. We're at the Charcuteries. We aim to create a visually compelling story from a provided data set in just four days with nothing but Tableau and collaboration. Hi, I'm Eric. Animated movies really have a special place in all of our hearts, the three of us, but also I bet most of you could think of an animated movie that has touched your heart in some way, whether it was from childhood, adulthood, anything in between really doesn't really matter, but there is something special about them. Um, however, a lot of them are really kind of seen as either childish or cartoony kind of movies, something that's really cute and lighthearted, but there's always so much more to animated movies than that, and that's kind of what we're going to get into with our analysis here. Starting off with the fact that animated movies really are a global phenomenon. Many of us think that most animated movies we can think of either come from Disney or DreamWorks or something like that. Um, it's not necessarily the case, and um, animation has been around a lot longer than that as a medium for film. All the way back to 1892 is the oldest recorded movie in this data set, and actually it comes from France. While a lot of them are comedies, as you can see here, um, it is absolutely the dominant genre. Um, family movies are not close behind, but a similar kind of light-hearted sort of feeling to it. Um, the third most popular genre for animated movies is actually dramas. Um, the U.S. has produced 164 of those. Um, Russia has produced 15 of them. In fact, for a long time over Russia's timeline, um, dramas were really the only kind of animated movies that they even produced until the late 1990s when other genres kind of started to creep in there. Uh, a little bit more of a feel-good thing for some of us. In certain parts of the world, not necessarily the case. So yeah, the medium of animation in movies um, really is a, a global thing, um, and it has a very rich, complex history to it. Uh, as you'll see here, uh, English may be the number one language by far, with uh, almost 28,000 movies in there. Produced in English, um, Japanese is uh, not far behind. Uh, Russian and French are not far behind that either. Um, plenty of uh, languages originating from Europe and Asia have lots of animated movies produced in those original languages. Um, something else that we were kind of uh, taking a look at here is run times. Um, as you can see, animated movies have steadily gotten longer throughout history. However, around 2008, they kind of topped out for the most part. Um, and then from there, they, they started to dip for several years. That's most likely due to the proliferation of animated shorts, resources, technology became more available to, to more people, uh, more creative people, more independent movie studios, and that kind of gave rise to the animated short as sort of a mainstream form of entertainment and also artistry. Another interesting little tidbit that we found, certain languages have uh, a correlation to certain runtimes, and there's actually quite a difference between some of them. They range all the way from 140 minutes down to just under 38 minutes and everything in between. While thousands of these movies have been produced across the globe, let's find out which ones really resonated the most with people. So the data suggests that heftier budgets do translate to higher revenue. Uh, the return on investment is there. No one wants to see low budget films. Um, Pixar, Walt Disney subsidiary, tops the charts at 7.93 billion, followed by Universal Pictures. And then uh, Frozen 2 made the top title at 1.45 billion. We can also see that a lot of these are sequels. Uh, audiences seem to really love sequels and appear to bring in more money than the original titles here. We can see that ONF slash NFB, which is a Canadian company, comes in as a top production company. However, more titles does not mean success with revenues and ratings as their titles don't quite make it into the top 10. Being Beauty uh, scored number one in the top titles uh, with the highest average of votes. 
and Elemental also wins the popularity contest here. Future projects, we could do web scrapping for the missing data to improve our data quality or look into production time. But currently, Michelle was our MVP for data cleaning with her Jupyter Notebook and Python. I was blessed to be on this team. They were so good to work with, um, even with the time zone challenge. Communication was really easy with Discord. We were able to drop our files into our chat and have direct communication while each of us was doing our part. Thank you to The Pudding and Triple Pen for hosting this code jam. And I invite all of you watching to explore our project further. Right on. That was pretty dope. Okay. Um, I forgot to mention who the, who's on this team. So let me take that moment now before I ask some questions. So on chart cootery, <laughs> we have Eric Pranowitz, Tiffany Berger, and then Michelle Lee. Uh, my last name is Burgett. <clears throat> Oh, sorry, Tiffany. I was hoping the power of the Tiffany's was going to help us there, and it didn't. It didn't help me at all. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Even my students get it wrong. <laughs> well, thank you for being so gracious about that. Let me start with, um, let's start with Eric. So Eric, pretty cool um, in general, right? Like the topics that you guys decided to tackle. Can you tell us more about Tableau? Because like, I know we've seen other presentations, and um, I certainly am more familiar as a layperson, right, with data <laughs> being in a very static form, but you were doing a lot of things, and the, the data you were presenting, the visualizations were changing, and so talk to me about Tableau and how, what kind of um, industry use that has, I guess. Uh, well, Tableau, I love Tableau because the presentations you can make with it can be extremely interactive and it's all done through filters. So um, with the dashboards and with the, the whole story layout that you're able to do with it, you can put in as many different visualizations as you want. You can arrange it exactly how you want to really tell a story as you click on something everything else goes away and you can just focus on that if you use whatever chart you use as a filter for the dashboard that you're on. Um, and I love that because I, I mean, I think it has unlimited uses in terms of industries. I mean, I've, I have a business background and it's super helpful for things like that. You know, say you're looking at a timeline and you want to focus on just one period and you have all of these other, you know, profits or expenses or whatever, you know, what have you, if you just select a point on that timeline, everything else changes to just show what was going on at that specific time. And I think that's huge because I can't think of another software platform that does that as effectively as Tableau does. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, we only had a few days to work on it, but I mean, the the possibilities with it are endless. And if, you know, if, if this was a project that we had a, a longer kind of lead on, um, I think we could have been able to do so much. There was one thing in particular that we were trying to do was um, the, in specific, we were trying to look at all these things through time and how things sort of progress throughout history. Because there was, I mean, there was data going back to like the late 1890s in there. And wow. um, I wanted to see if I could figure out a way to sort everything like by decade. And you could use a little slider to say like, oh, like in the 20s, like this thing was big. But in the 90s, like it's all flipped to this. But we could only get it down to um, a year. And that felt kind of exhausting to go through things year by year <laughs> but um there's there's ways that you can make that happen but it takes a, a bit more like work and we were kind of getting there but it was sort of starting to be a bit of a time suck so we did have to sure. abandon that but um yeah that's tableau in a nutshell <laughs> cool now, Tiffany, whenever you were talking at the end there, you were talking about Michelle and she wasn't able to be here on the call, but you called her there, uh, your your MVP on your team because of her Python and Jupyter notebook. Um, can you tell us a little more about that so we can learn how Python and Jupyter notebooks, because that's usually on the software engineering side, right? Like how is that blending into this data world? 
Yeah, so Eric and I are both um, business intelligence analysts. And in the data analyst program that Michelle actually was in, they got to work with Jupyter Notebook and they learned Python, which I think is a huge edge. Um, And I do plan on self-studying Python. Mm. Um, So she was able to look at all of the data in her Jupyter Notebook. She would type in Python prompts asking hey, explore this specific aspect. And then it would tell her um, some exploratory exploratory data uh, insights. And that's how we decided which columns we didn't need for our our analysis and which um, topics that we were going to hone and focus in on. It, It made that part of our project so much faster. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yeah. So, and I think you brought up a really good point that at Triple Ten, there are two different schools, right? Um, so there's one that's the business analyst one, and the other one is data science. And so those have two different focuses, right? One being more of that business impact, right? How does this data drive business decisions? And and then the other being data science around like creating those visualizations and deriving meaning from um, just kind of numbers on a page, so to speak. So really, really interesting. Um, I think all of you guys did an amazing job. Um, I saw Tiffany that you sent me a question asking about how people can vote. So I would say, um, so on the discord for fan favorites. So um, after our stream today, we are going to put a discord poll for our students. And um, then that way they can go ahead and vote there. If you're not a student of ours yet, um, then you can go ahead and vote either in the um, chat, nope, excuse me, comment feature of the live stream. It is recorded. So if there are people who are not able to watch, it will be, you know, uploaded later and the comment section will still be available there. So the the voting window is open for a week. So it's not something that has to be done um, this very second. So no panics there. Um, let's see, were there any other questions I saw? Um, the teams um, did ask that th- the teams are going to share their tableaus with each other um, because obviously they're so rich with all of this information. And I would recommend um, that all of you take the opportunity to uh, post, host your tableaus in a place where they can be publicly accessed as well. So you could even link those on your LinkedIn. And then that way, if anyone is watching this at home and is very interested in seeing more of your data and how you broke it apart, then they could also access your Tableau through your LinkedIn profile. That is a really cool thing. Because like you said, um, Eric, there's some some visualizations that just are a little too time consuming for our live stream today. But there are lots of really great pieces of data that um, I know I will want to explore personally. So, all right, that is going to take care of us for today. That is our our March code pudding, data pudding, putting on the putting on the Ritz. Mm, Ritz and pudding don't go together. Maybe not. Um, so, I want to say thank you to all of the teams that um, have joined us today. I know it is early in some places. And I appreciate it all the same. I hope everyone is going to have a great weekend. Thank you to everyone at home that is watching, whether you're watching this live or you're watching this recorded. Um, I know that you are definitely feeling as impressed as I am with the work that our students were able to put out in four days. And so if this is something that you feel like you're interested in, please reach out to me or any of the students to ask more questions about our Triple Ten programs. And then let's see, students be on the lookout for the poll in Discord. Rest of the viewers are going to comment. Results and winners, yes, important. So that we can make sure that our results get their their big prizes. So our results are going to be announced at 8 a.m., excuse me, at April 8th on our Discord. So please pay attention there. We will also be posting them on Instagram. I would like to send out a special thanks to everyone behind the scenes who helped organize this, which is Arena, Anastasia, Larissa, Alyssa, Olivia, Natasha, Ulia, Daniela, Nadia, and my cat Sharkbait. Thank you again to all of the participants um, for presenting your work today. 
I, I can't tell you how this is the first one we've done with just data and business. And I am so excited. I can't wait for us to start planning the next one. The things that you guys have been able to bring to life from just miles and miles of Excel data cells um, is like, it just gives me life. So thank you so very much. We couldn't do this without your enthusiasm and your courageousness to be willing to present to everybody in the world. My name is Tiffany Hall. You can find me at Tiffany Codes on Instagram. You can find my business, RilexCustomWorks.com. You can find my cat by his food bowl or the window, probably the window. It's a little early. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. Have a great, great weekend. And Jillian, if you go into labor, best of luck. Thank, Thank you. you, guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. It was great, yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. That was fantastic.